In this presentation, we will take a look at multiple choice questions related to receivables. First question, which practice reports estimated bad debts expense during the period the sales are recorded? A, bad debt method, B, accounts receivable aging, C, adjusting bad debt expense method, D, allowance method, E, cash basis method. So we'll go through these again, go through the process of elimination. Which practice reports estimated bad debts expense during the period the sales are recorded? A, bad debt method. I'll keep that one for now. B says accounts receivable aging. Uh, that's not really a method, that's more like a, <laughs> that's more like a report that we might use to help us. So I'm gonna say that one's not. C says adjusting bad debt expense method. And I don't know about that. I'll keep that for now. D says the allowance method. That sounds familiar. I'll keep that for now. And then E says cash basis method. And uh, that's uh, a method, but it's a method for uh, normal accrual versus a cash basis method. So it's not a method for uh, this particular item that we're looking at for bad debts. We're left then with A, C, and D. Let's read through this again. Which practice reports estimated bad debts expense during the period the sales are recorded? So A says bad debts method. Now, if you if you look through this, you, you probably might say, hmm, that doesn't really ring a bell. It sounds like it could be a method, bad debt method, but it's not really a method, actually. There's I don't think there's a, I don't think that's one of the methods. The two methods we should kind of know after if we're going through a chapter basically or a review of the material on this type of stuff are going to be the direct write-off method and the allowance method. So that doesn't look like it. C says the adjusted bad debt expense method, adjusting bad debt expense method. And again, that's kind of what we're doing, but it's not really the name of the method typically. So that's not it. Actually, D I know sounds familiar. That's the allowance method. And if we go through these these questions or these types of questions, we should be able to recognize that um, the allowance method is going to be the preferred method. And uh, that should so the answer is often going to be the allowance method when the question is, you know, basically what's the method we should be using? The allowance method. Now, why? Uh, because this is basically explaining the, the matching principle up here, that we're going to record the expense at the same time the sale was made. That's what the allowance method attempts to do, or one of the things it attempts to do, which is to uh, try to match up the bad debt expense that we have uh, in the same time period that the related sales are made. Next question. The entry to record the write-off against the allowance accounts results in... So let's read through that one more time. The entry to record write-off against the allowance account results in... So we got a write... So we're, we're recording a write-off. A. An increase in the expenses. B. A reduction in current assets. C. A reduction in net income. D. An increase in equity and E, no effect on the expenses. So let's read through that one more time. The entry to record the write-off against the allowance accounts results in. Now anytime it says there's an entry, like we're talking about a journal entry, even if it doesn't give us a number as we don't have here, it's best to write down the entry. What are the debits and credits? What are the accounts that would be affected? If we want to make up a number to write the number in for the debit and or credit, that's fine too. So if we're going to record an entry to write off uh, the allowance, typically what we're saying is that uh, an AR, an accounts receivable, became uncollectible and we're going to write it off. Accounts receivable is an asset and so we're going to write it off by doing uh, the opposite thing to it to make it go down. It has a debit balance. We're going to credit it. So I'm going to credit the accounts receivable by whatever, the $100. And then we're going to debit something. And what are we going to uh, debit? Now, under the direct write-off method, it would be bad debt. Under the allowance method, it would be allowance for doubtful accounts. That's for doubtful. I won't write this out because that's looking terrible already. But that's the debit. So here's the debit. So here's the debit and the credit in any case. The allowance for doubtful accounts and the credit to accounts receivable. So once we know that, this will be a lot easier, hopefully, to, to think through. So. So an increase in the expenses. 
Now note here that neither of these are expense type or income statement accounts here. Uh, they're not income statement accounts at all. They're really right next to each other. They're both asset accounts, one asset going up, the other asset going down. So when we look at the accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus equity, we know that one asset went up and the other asset went down. And so there's no net effect when we write it off under the allowance method, unlike the direct write off method. So B says reduce current assets. And again, you might think that would seem reasonable because we're reducing accounts receivable, but we're also um, increasing or we're also recording the other side to the allowance method, which is a contra asset account. So we're, re we're, um, we're reducing the accounts receivable and we're reducing the allowance for doubtful accounts. We're reducing the debit balance account of accounts receivable and reducing the credit balance account of allowance. In any case, we're, we're, we're having the assets go up and down, no net effect. C says a reduction in net income. And again, there's no, there's no effect on net income. And note here too that if we looked at uh, C and A, an increase in the expenses and a reduction in net income, they seem similar because if we were to write off the expense, the bad debt expense, then um, it would be increasing the expenses, which would reduce net income. And because they cannot both be correct, we're going to say those two actually kind of cancel each other out. C says uh, no increase in equity and increase in equity. And again, if there's, there's, no, there's no increase in equity because the accounting equation effect is really null. There's no effect on it. And then E says no effect on expenses. So E's got to be the correct answer. And that's really the point here. When we write off the bad debt expense using the allowance method, we're not recording anything to uh, the income statement and therefore nothing to expenses at that point in time. So correct answer. The entry to record the write-off against the allowance accounts results in E, no effect on the expenses. Next question. Honoring a note receivable indicates that the maker has A, signed the note, B, made a promise, made a promise, should be C, uh, guaranteed to pay, D, notarized the note signing, E, paid interest and principal. So let's go through this again, process of elimination. Honoring a note receivable indicates that the maker has signed the note. Now you might think if you, if you don't really know what the honoring process is, you might say, hmm, well that kind of, you know, that kind of seals the deal of signing it. So I'll keep that for now. B says made a promise and that's kind of what the note is doing. C says guaranteed to pay. And again, that's kind of what the note is doing. D says notarized the note. That would be someone else kind of uh, usually a third party that would give some more verification as to the formal process and the signature process of, of the note. It's actually not, we'll cross that one out, it's not D. And E says paid interest and principal. And so that happens at the end of the note. So all of these things kind of take place in the note if we don't really know what honoring means. Um, we might say, hmm, all of those look pretty good. So if we read through this one more time, honoring a note receivable indicates that the maker has. Now the honoring of it doesn't have to do with the promising side of it at the, at the making of the note. It has to do with what happens at the end. And we might be able to use the process of elimination to, to get to that, right? It's the honoring the note has to do with signing the note uh, to make a promise, made a promise, and guarantee to pay. Now, all of those things happen basically when we make the note. So we might say, you know, if, if all of those things happen when we make the note, maybe they can kind of cancel each other out. Whereas this one happens at the end of the note when we pay the note. So we might be able to say, well, you know, maybe these, these are kind of on all the same type of thing happening at the, at the signing. And therefore, E through the processes of elimination might be more correct in that sense. Uh, and E is correct because of the fact that honoring it means that we have made a promise at the beginning, here's the promise. When we sign the note, when we make a promise, that's what the note is basically doing, a guaranteed payment, a promise to pay in the future. E means we, we um, have honored that promise by typically paying the principal and interest that we promised to pay. So E is gonna be the correct answer. Uh, once again, honoring a note receivable indicates that the maker has E, paid interest and principal.